I'm not worried about Finney Smith. His contract is reasonable enough. If they wanted to trade him tomorrow, they could get a first round pick. I'm not worried about that. Really? But it's gets it off in time. And he's got it, baby! Big time Nets win. Oof, the only net fans you know. The only what? The only Nets fans you know. Man. I mean, come on, Look man. Or are these guys? Welcome back to the Only Net Fans You Know podcast. I'm Peter. Welcome to episode number 80. We have a very special guest today, CBS Sports NBA reporter Sam Quinn. How's it going on, Sam? What's up? It's good. Um, We're kind of at the last point in the offseason where I can say that I'm rested and excited because we've got camp coming up in like a week or two. And then from that point onward, it's just basketball, basketball, basketball. So like you caught me at a good time. You taught me when I'm like right off of vacation. I'm excited. I haven't like watched the Nets yet and been worn down by how bad they're going to be. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. Uh, I'm going to just jump straight into it. You do this amazing article each year ranking all the traded first round picks. There's 68 of them. Last year, the Nets were three out of the top, I think four or six picks. This year, a lot different. Uh, obviously, we had the Mikhail Bridges trade. We had the Rockets trade. Nets get back their 25 pick and 26 pick. If you're a Nets fan, uh, what should we be looking out for? What's the perspective on all these draft picks? The Nets were higher on the list last year in part because their best picks are not on the list this year. I wrote this in sort of a little like post word after the fact. The two best picks, I think, that technically were traded, but I didn't list them, were the Nets pick in 25 and the Nets pick in 26. When you talk about these teams like Phoenix and Milwaukee and the Clippers that have these picks that are really high up, you're talking about teams that are good today but are probably going to be bad in a few years. What separates those Nets picks is that they're bad today. We know they're bad. There's no guesswork involved. We know they're trying to lose. So, yeah, they had more picks at the top of the list last year, but that was because their own picks were Houston's. Now their own picks belong to them, and I took them off of the list for that reason. The other one I would point out that I thought was a little bit interesting that I didn't really start to think about until I wrote the list. I think last year that Dallas pick, I think it's 2029 that they got from the Kyrie trade was very, very high on the list. Now this year it's attached to the Houston trade where I think in 2029 Houston gets the two best out of Phoenix, Dallas and its own and Brooklyn gets whichever one is last but it went from a very, very good pick towards the middle. And I think something that shows you when you're talking about really good teams that you're sort of predicting doom and gloom for down the line, it can change so quickly because all it took for Dallas, it was basically one great off season where they draft Eric Lively, one great trade deadline where they trade for PJ Washington, Daniel Gafford. And suddenly their entire future looks entirely different. They go on a run to the NBA finals That's sort of the danger of any of these deep future picks. The benefit of the situation the Nets are in right now is that they have so many picks. They're so diversified across so many different teams that, yeah, they might not have quite as many premium picks from other teams. Those Phoenix picks probably were their premium picks in the past, but they have so many that you kind of figure that sooner or later, one of them is going to be something good. It might be one or two of those Knicks picks. It might be that swap they still have with Phoenix. It might be one of the picks they had from Philly. Like, they're very well diversified. They have their own picks back. They can control those picks. So you figure, hopefully, you get two high picks in 25 and 26, and then you kind of just wait it out. You think, maybe it'll be a Knicks pick. Maybe it'll be the Suns pick. Maybe it'll be somebody else. But we're betting that sooner or later we're going to get something really good. Looking at the the Knicks picks from the Mikhail Bridges trade, you got Brunson re-signing, getting that extension on a very team-friendly deal. You know, I, I hate to say it as a Nets fan, Knicks look pretty good going forward. Uh, looking at those those picks, obviously we're talking about a 2031 Knicks first rounder, so many years down the line. So this is more of, um, you know, taking a guess and whatnot. I mean, here's what I'll say about picks seven years out. Seven years ago today, Kyrie Irving was a member of the Cleveland Cavaliers. What does that tell you? Like in seven years, a lot of stuff can change. How many teams today 
look like they looked seven years ago. It's a very, very short list. So I would generally say the benefit of trading for picks seven years out is that the NBA is an inherently chaotic league and stuff is going to change. Does that mean the Knicks are going to be bad in 2031? No, I don't know. It's hard to say, right? I mean, Jalen Brunson is, I don't want to say old, but he's not young either. He's kind of smack in the middle of his prime. Mikhail Bridges is as well. They're not a young team. You figure their peak is going to be these next three or four years, and then it's probably going to go down. They might be able to pivot somehow. Like, look, it's New York. Guys always want to play there. I don't know if those Knicks, team, those Knicks picks are going to be good or bad. What I will say is over the course of seven years, it's rare that any team is good that entire window. So I generally feel pretty good about controlling a team's entire draft. And the other thing I would point out, and I wrote about this in the story, when it comes to draft picks, perception is really important because perception is what you know informs trade value. So even if the Knicks aren't actually bad in seven years, all it takes is like, oh, no, one guy has injury issues or, oh, we're uncertain about this element of the franchise. Tom Thibodeau resigns. Leon Rose resigns. Like any little bit of instability you get over a seven-year period and there's going to be some. We just don't know what it's going to be. Suddenly, those picks become a lot easier to trade. So, look, again, I'm not going to sit here and say I know where the Knicks are going to pick in 2031. What I'm going to say is I think those picks are probably going to yield a substantial amount of value. I just don't know exactly how that's going to happen yet. When the Nets got uh, Harden, KD, and Kyrie, if you would have told me the less than five years down the line, everything would have been blown up, I would have said you're crazy, right? Stuff happens. Looking at this rocket steal when the Nets got back to 25 and 26 pick, how bad was that deal? I say it was highway robbery for the Rockets. Now, I think the Nets had to make that deal. What do you think about that deal? Yeah, I, I just disagree. I, from the way I look at it for the Nets, they traded picks they don't control for picks that they do, right? Like, don't get me wrong. I am, as the story I wrote shows, very much in favor of controlling Phoenix picks. I think Phoenix is headed for a disaster in the next few years, and I don't think I'm alone in that opinion. But you can't control what the Suns do. You can control what the Nets do. If you do this right as the Nets, you can guarantee yourselves two top five picks. If you get two top five picks from another team, think about how rare that is, right? The only time I can ever really think of that happening is ironically with the Nets, with Tatum and Brown, right? Like most of the time, if you're trading out a bunch of deep future picks, one of them might hit, but it's pretty rare that a team that has no incentive to be bad is consistently bad over a long period. So ultimately, the way I looked at it was like they took back control of their own future. Did they pay a significant price for that? Sure, I can see that. Those They gave up higher volume. They gave up, I think it was four draft assets for two but they got the best picks in the deal. And look, I know what the reporting has said on this. I know that the Nets have been adamant to everybody that they've spoken to where they said, we would only have traded Mikhail Bridges if we knew we were going to do this trade as well. I'm going to say this. This is just my opinion. I'm not reporting anything. I don't believe them. I think that they would have made the Mikhail Bridges trade either way because they had absolutely no reason not to. I'm sorry, there was no alternative path available to them. They were not going to lure a star. They were not going to trade for someone. There wasn't someone on the market this offseason that was worth trading for. They were just looking down the barrel of another year where they had the eighth or ninth worst record, right? What's the point of that? You gain nothing out of it. That Knicks offer, look, we don't know what those picks are going to be worth, but that's five first round picks and a swap. For a player who's never been an all-star, it would have been irresponsible of them not to take that trade. I don't care what they say. I don't care what anybody reports. I believe the Nets would have made that trade either way. From that perspective, honestly, if I were Houston and I graded them negatively at the time, I would have just held on to the Nets picks. I don't love this idea that the Rockets have, that they're going to hold on to Phoenix's picks and ransom them back to the Suns someday for Devin Booker or Kevin Durant. I mean... Devin Booker, I kind of get it because he's younger. If you're doing that for Durant, I don't get it. He's just too old for them. Um, I don't know. I just would have tried my luck with the picks. That's my opinion. Um, 
I think that was a great trade for the Nets. The Rocket side is a little bit more debatable just because they didn't have control over the Nets picks and the Nets did. So it's a little bit more debatable on the Houston side. For the Nets, I just don't think there's ever any pick that's as valuable as your own. You can make yourself bad. You can't make somebody else bad. Nets are going to have a lot of cap room coming into next offseason if they can get off the contracts of Cam Johnson and Dorian Finney-Smith. I wrote an article on the new CBA. I think the second, uh, the second apron penalties are just so harsh that you see guys, maybe not starters, but definitely valuable role players on a team, maybe getting a, a minimum deal, like a Tyrus Thomas. Uh, I think it was Tyrus Thomas of, uh, of Phoenix, uh, the point guard, uh, signing a minimum oh, deal after getting a great extension offer from the Wizards, wants to turning it down, and now he's getting stuck with a minimum deal. Is it going to be hard to get rid of a Cam Johnson's contract who's making over $20 million and not really, you know, the hottest thing right now? I think they could probably trade Cam Johnson. I think the issue they're going to run into is they're thinking about Cam Johnson in an isolation as how valuable is he as an asset when what they should be thinking is how can we get rid of this guy as quickly as possible not because we don't like the contract, not because we're worried about the medicals, which is a fair thing to be worried about, but because we need to lose as many games as possible and we don't want good players on our team. That's the real concern here to me. And that's something I think we're seeing this in Portland too, where like Jeremy Grant could be traded for good value in a heartbeat. The Blazers are holding out for maximum value and like maybe they get it at the deadline. But is that worth the extra four or five wins you're going to get from having that guy in your team? If I'm the Nets, it's much more important to me to trade Cam Johnson and Dorian Finney-Smith quickly than it is to trade them for maximum value. I'm not worried about Finney-Smith. His contract is reasonable enough. If they wanted to trade him tomorrow, they could get a first-round pick. I'm not worried about that. Really? But if you're going to be the greedy team that sits here and says, we need to get two or like we need to get one and a good young player, like, Maybe that's on the table in February. Personally, I doubt it. But what's worse is that you're going to hurt your own chance at tanking in that way. Like, my goal is just move these guys quickly and lose. Do you think Cam Johnson and Dory Finney-Smith actually add that much value to the team win-wise? And do you think Dory Finney-Smith, after seeing how this offseason played out, does he opt into his player option? It's $15 million. I think he would opt in. I Originally, I didn't think he would. I think he might now. What do you think? Am I wrong? 3 and D wings are at such a premium that I think the wing is always going to test free agency. The guys that don't want to test free agency right now are the non-shooting centers and the non-defensive point guards. Like Tyus Jones is the guy who goes out and gets a minimum deal. Tyus Jones is like maybe the best backup point guard in the NBA. The NBA doesn't value backup point guards anymore. Meanwhile, the Knicks already have OG Ananobi and Josh Hart, and they say we're going to have five picks for Mikhail Bridges. Nobody can have enough wings. I'm not worried about Dorian Finney-Smith. If he opts out, somebody's going to pay him. It might be through a sign-in trade. might be through the mid-level exception. He'll get paid. The Cam Johnson question is a little bit more interesting, and I think, ironically, it was just a matter of being slow because I look at that contract that Detroit gave Tobias Harris, and I just sort of think like, wouldn't the Pistons rather have Cam Johnson at similar money? I guess it's one more year, but a younger guy, they were interested in, in him in the past. So I don't, I don't know that Cam Johnson's market is quite so wide just because of the medical issues in the bigger contract, but I don't know. Like I think Detroit would have much rather had Cam Johnson. I can think of three or four teams that are so needy for wings that they'd probably give up something of substance for him too. I just don't know why he's on the Nets. I don't know who this is serving. Like, it's one thing. There are teams who, like, oh, we need to keep our shooters because we need them to help develop our young guys. Who are the Nets developing right now? Like, they don't have their premium young guys yet. Obviously, you want to ship out those two vets. What would you do next after that? I think from there, getting those two out is the most important thing. What I'm kind of thinking next is I'd kind of like to know if Cam Thomas is like a real ball handler, like high usage, run an offense through him type of guy, or if he's just kind of like a carnival six man type. Like 
I just did something on Cam Thomas where I was looking into some of his numbers. He averaged more minutes than passes last year. You know how hard that is? To play more minutes than you have total passes? You're not passing once per minute? Like, there isn't much on the roster this year where I look at and say, like, they can figure something out here. They can do some work that will have benefits down the line for them. Figuring out how real Cam Thomas is as anything other than a scorer is the sole basketball priority in my eyes. I'll say this about Cam Thomas. After JB was fired, they changed the offense a little bit. You saw Cam Thomas pass a little bit more, but overall, who was he passing to last year? I don't, it's a habit thing, though. I, I I know that they don't really, like, he's not in a position where he can be some great playmaker, but I also just want to see the decisions that he's making. Like, I want to see him make the easy passes. I don't think he's ever going to be some high-end playmaker, but I want to see him use his scoring to create opportunities for teammates. I want to see him making common sense decisions as opposed to like, well, there are three guys on me and I'm headed for the corner. Better step back and shoot. Like, I just want to see him look like a real basketball player instead of just a gunner. A lot of people don't know how to grade him. Is he a chucker? Is he putting up 25 points a night? Going to be a future all-star. What do you think his contract looks like if the Nets do resign him? I think the issue they're going to run into is that Cam Thomas is going to put up such big volume numbers that he and his agent are going to ask for the money that typically comes with those numbers, as opposed to acknowledging the reality that like the reason you're putting out these numbers is that we have nobody else to shoot. So if you can re-sign him this offseason at something like high-end backup money, I'd do that. Like, yeah, I can get him for $15 million a year. I think that's a good bet. I don't know exactly what the number is, but something where you're not locking him in and feeling like, oh man, he has to be our starting point guard. Oh man, he has to be a cornerstone of our team. I just don't want to be in a position where like I'm paying him based on the player his raw numbers suggest he is. I would much rather pay him as the player that like I think he would be on a good team. I'm going to bring it back to something I said before because I don't think I got your full answer on it. Talking about the second apron and the penalties and whatnot. How harsh is it going to be for that first team that winds up having their uh, first round pick years down the line frozen and sent straight to 30 and then they wind up getting the chance to tank? You get to that year that the pick was frozen and instead of picking maybe like in the top 10, you're automatically at 30. Is that reality kind of set in yet with teams? Or is it just so far down the line that you say, you know what, we're in the second apron now. That probably means we're a com- contending team. We're going to about right now. We'll worry about seven years down the line later. I don't think we're going to see – I'm not going to say any because there are always outliers. I don't think we're going to see many teams do the thing where they stay far enough above the second apron for long enough that they're having their picks dropped. Like I'll give you a couple of examples. Boston right now is set up to be far above the second apron in the next two years. And then Chris Stapp's Porzingis expires and they can duck back under in the third year. Minnesota far over the second apron this season. Rudy Gobert has a player option for next year. I am operating under the assumption that he will either be gone. Carl Anthony Towns will be gone or Gobert will be re-signed to a longer deal at a much smaller overall number. I think the way teams are looking at this now is you have to stay below the line as long as possible, and then once you go over, it's a two-year window. You have a two-year window to maximize your championship odds. Whatever you can get in that stretch, great, because once that two-year window ends, you have to start cutting costs. No team is going to willingly take that drop to number 30, unless they're already a championship team, right? Like say hypothetically Boston wins the next two championships. They have a three-peat going. Then it makes sense for them to re-sign Chris Satt-Porzingis and say, we're going for the four-peat. We'll drop our pick. It's worth it. We're a dynasty. If you're Minnesota and you're a team that is like, we're so far capped at the conference finals, you can't justify that. The cost is just way too high. So I look at Denver this offseason. Why did they let KCP go? Why were they so dogmatic about saying, we will not pay the second apron this year? 
Well, because they had to re-sign Jamal Murray and they had to re-sign Aaron Gordon. And that meant they were locked above the second apron for the 25-26 and 26-27 seasons before Michael Porter Jr. expires and they could duck back under. They looked at this and said, we know what our two second apron years are going to be. Keeping KCP is not worth it. We're not pushing that clock forward a year. That's the way teams are going to operate. Delay as long as possible, go for two years, and then duck under. What about Phoenix? You don't think that they might be a casualty? Well, they're just, they have no idea what they're doing. Like that, I hate to be, <laughs> I hate to be like that blase about it, but the Suns kind of just don't have a plan. I wish I could tell you that they did, but the likeliest outcome for Phoenix is just not advancing far the next year or two. And at some point having a come to Jesus moment where they realize like, oh my God, we have really, really set ourselves back for a long, long time. And that's when you have to start asking yourself the hard questions. Like, do we need to trade Devin Booker? When those Houston rumors came up in June or July, whenever it was, I was the one saying like, Phoenix, you're not going to win the championship. If Houston will bail you out and trade for Kevin Durant now, you should really do it. Because Devin Booker is young enough that if you get assets back, maybe you could rebuild some other kind of team around him. But as it stands right now, I think they're probably just going to lose in the first or the second round for the next year or two and then have nowhere to go. You are now the GM of the Brooklyn Nets. What do you do in the 25 offseason? Do you tra- make trades to increase your draft capital, find guys on one-year deals? Well, what would be your, your vision for that one year, and what should Nets fans be looking forward to? You know, I've seen the like, oh, Jimmy Butler is interested in them, like line of thinking. We've heard Jimmy Butler's name surface. Kind of a strange time for this to be happening. What are right. your thoughts on that? Is there anything you could tell us? It's, it's very real. It's very real. I, I, I can't get into details for a number of reasons, but Jimmy Butler's interest in the Brooklyn Nets is very, very real. I've seen the line of thinking where it's like, oh, we're going to like be bad for one year and then sign some free agents and try to be good. That would be so irresponsible based on the trade that they made. You traded a premium to get your first round pick back in 26. You have to be bad in 26. There's no way around that. If you traded all that capital for a pick that you then intentionally made worse, that's a fireable offense by Sean Marks. You made that trade to be bad. You are going to keep being bad. The next two years, whatever what happens after that is another matter. The next two years, you have to be bad. So you're going to be bad this year. You get to the 25 off season. When you have all this cap space, all I'm thinking is, who wants to give me draft picks to eat their bad contracts? Like, who who has those contracts? Send them my way. I'll eat them and I'll take your picks. Like, that's it. That's all I'm thinking. How can I use that cap space for long-term gain? I am not under any circumstances trying to be good in the 25-26 season. I ask every guest this. I usually ask them, what is their favorite Nets jersey? I'm, I'm going to open it up to you a little bit. What is your favorite NBA jersey? Could be any team, any era, throwback, ABA, NBA. What is your favorite? I'm really partial to the era in the 90s where the design elements were just such bold colors and so in your face where like the Hawks would have a jersey where a Hawk would take up the entire front of the jersey. The Bucks had one like that. I was a really big fan of those 90s Bucks jerseys that were green and purple. Mm-hmm. I might pick those. I might pick the original Raptors jerseys that had a similar vibe with the red and the purple. It's more of an era than a single jersey to me, but I really just loved the time, the brief moment in NBA history where the design element of the league was like, be as big and ridiculous as possible. My favorite Nets jersey, I was partial to the gray jerseys they wore during the kid era where I just, I like that design a lot. It might be just be because I grew up with those jerseys, but I really liked the gray. I think gray is a really underrated color for jerseys. They have a gray jersey now that I like. I just like the design on those better. So I guess I would say the kid era gray would probably be my Nets pick. My overall pick, give me the big buck jersey from the Bucks in the mid-90s. 
Mm. That's a good pick. I, I respect it. What's your what the competition is? My favorite, and that's the only answer you should what you should have said was the Dr. J Nets jerseys. That's just the best jersey of all time. But the Toronto Raptors uh purple jersey. The Nets Dr. J jerseys were just too plain for me. They're they're oh, nice, they're just too plain for me. I like a more ambitious that. jersey. I grew up in the 90s. Like, I like bold in your face jerseys. It's definitely the most distinct. It's the only era in NBA history where you feel like the entire league was on the same wavelength. Mm. You're right. You're right. I'm wrong. All right, Sam. Do you have any plugs you want to throw out there? Uh, just read cbsports.com. Follow me on Twitter, Sam Quinn CBS. Uh, we do good stuff. We have a bunch of stuff coming out. Our top 100 ranking of the best players in the NBA comes out next week. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. And uh, other than that, yeah, just every all things CBS Sports. Big time for us. NFL season's going. All right, guys. You can follow me at, at NetFriends, you know, on Twitter, on YouTube. Check out my writing for Off the Ball Network for the whole season. I'm going to be putting out stories about the Nets and Nets-related stuff. Anyway, guys, thanks again. Have a great day. Have a great night. And uh, let's go Nets.